Um, what's like your earliest memory of learning or liking biology? Like when did you start liking biology? I would say, honestly, we had a saltwater aquarium at home after we moved down to Texas. I don't know, because we wanted to try something <laughs> cool like that. And like, the biology that goes on in a saltwater aquarium is really, like we had some corals and stuff, and so you can like cut the corals and mm -hmm. propagate them, and it was kind of cool. Uh, so I would say that's like the first like, I don't know, other than like, I'm an aerospace engineer undergrad, mm -hmm. and we had no biology, so my previous biology experience was high school biology. Uh, <laughs> So I, th I think that's probably what piqued my interest a bit. Uh, my, my wife's also a nurse, uh, and so I was always, you know, interested in medical field. I've had my share of medical care needed for whatever, so, you know, I guess it's, it's that kind of talks about biology too, I guess, it's just how it applies to medicine and yeah. how, how your body is doing stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so what, what would you say is the most applicable lesson that we could learn in biology or biology related classes that would be most related to the work that you've done in BME or even aerospace? Right. Um, to me, it's like, I don't know, and this is maybe not, but to me, it's <laughs> just, it's so just the, I get amazed when I think about, you know, you talk about a cell and all the stuff that goes on in a cell is really complicated. Mm -hmm. And just to look down and like think of the trillions of cells that you have and that stuff is going on in every cell all the time, like that is, I don't know, that's what I take from biology is that's crazy yeah. that everything works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so since you've worked outside of BME and biology related yeah. fields, how can, how has or how can biology be um, applied like in NASA, for example, or other non-lab or medical fields. Right, and so I would say, I mean, NASA is pretty obvious because like we're interested in going to space and stuff, mm -hmm. and the limiting factor there is sending something biological to space, where it's not very kind to biological organisms. Uh, so, like there's a lot of challenges to think about mm -hmm. that we don't have to think about down here, you know, radiation and uh, weight, you know, weightlessness and how that affects everything and you know what happens when your body doesn't know what's up and down anymore mm -hmm. uh, so definitely a huge application in aerospace I mean you can even think like the other aerospace is like aero like airplanes right and there's a lot that goes on an airplane that's quote unquote not natural right like uh, you know especially if you think about you know, some of the extreme things like fighter jets or things like that and just the extreme forces that uh, people experience there. And also just, you know, how how to maintain comfort in an airplane, mm -hmm. uh, which includes like how much oxygen you need and, you know, how to get rid of, you know, all the carbon dioxide that's being produced on an airplane, right? Like there's a lot of people exhaling yeah. on an airplane. So there's a lot of biology that goes into mm -hmm. even getting all that done. Yeah. What do they do with the carbon dioxide? You know, I actually have no idea. Oh. <laughs> in the I've space station, I know, before. but I don't know what they do in an the airplane. They may okay. just bend it to the outside and, okay. you know, circulate air from the outside. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what made you originally want to pursue BME, like, after working so many years in aerospace industry? Right, and so a lot of it was, like I said, like, mm -hmm. the biggest challenges in aerospace are biological, right? And so, you know, even if somebody is up on the moon and breaks a leg, mm -hmm. right? Like that's a huge deal, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, do we x-ray them? You know, can we yeah. x-ray them? Can we, you know, what if we have to do surgery on the moon? You know what I mean? So, I mean, it's not a trivial thing. And so I'm like, mm -hmm. that would be cool to be able to work on things that I know are going to be, you know, applicable even to aerospace. Uh, and so that was my initial, like, you know, this would, caused me to look, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the more I looked into it, like, to me, I don't, I didn't even know, like, tissue engineering was a field. Okay. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I thought, you know, it was more like a Terminator model where we were going through this mechanical mm -hmm. prosthesis and stuff uh, to, bro to fix broken body parts. And so that's, 
And so I saw like a couple articles on tissue engineering. I was like, that's like to me that's insane, right? Like to actually grow a body part to replace, yeah. you know, something that's worn out versus, you know, a prosthetic. So mm -hmm. that's that's really what I wanted to go into then is tissue engineering, which I realized that that's really cool is just thinking about all the injuries and all the diseases that could be cured by tissue engineering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Um and do you think that working in another field and studying another field has helped you in um, BME? I mean, I think it's hard to isolate that. I mean, I think, I mean, this is what I tell people. Like, I would not have been mature enough at age 22 to get my PhD. And so it may just be like being older helped me a lot. <laughs> but I think, I, I don't know. I think I did well in my PhD. And I think certainly the experience I had, but whether that was because it was an or whatever I don't know yeah. um, but but definitely here I think when I teach like it's still engineering and so I can take a lot of those engineering experiences mm -hmm. and help my students kind of learn here's actual real real world engineering uh, that is done and this is how you know it can apply to what we're doing here in, in school mm -hmm. so that has helped for teaching for sure yeah okay. um, did you ever consider becoming a medical doctor no <laughs> I never no. Okay. Um, could you give a short description of your research topic? So I actually don't do any more research, but in my PhD I was doing heart valve research. And so when you when a person has heart valve problems, you it's pretty much there's no cure for it. So you pretty much have to get it replaced. Uh, and you actually because the blood feeds the rest of your body, you get pretty morbid pretty quick if your heart valves aren't working pr properly because you, your body's not getting oxygen in blood. Uh, and so when in replacement, you can either get a mechanical valve or you can get a pig valve mostly or cow uh, parts. Um, and so mechanical valves are good, but then you have to take warfarin, which is a powerful anticoagulant medication. And so like you can't clot basically. Uh, and so, you know, you might die of internal bleeding from a, somebody punched you in the gut, right? Because uh, normally it would bruise and it would clot and it'd be fine. But if you're taking powerful medications, then it would kill you. Uh, and so then the option is pig valves. And the problem is they're dead. They like fix them in glutaraldehyde. And so two things happen. Number one, they're dead. And so they can't self-repair. And so like you think of your normal heart valve, if it gets like a just, you know, a minor tear in it, the cells will just go fix it. But so a pig valve or a dead valve, like you know, a minor tear will start to grow and start to grow and start to grow and turn into a major tear and then the thing will fall apart. Okay, and so we wanted to build something that could fix that problem. And so thinking about a tissue engineered solution where we can actually implant something that's living or something that has the capability to recruit cells and then they would be living uh, would be really cool and be really helpful so that you can have a heart valve replacement and then it would be fixed permanently. Because, you know, if your valve falls apart, you know, if you have a pig valve because you don't want to take warfarin and you're 50 years old, you can have open heart surgery and have valve replacement surgery at 50. But, like, if it lasts 20 years, you can't have surgery anymore at 70, right? Like, it'll probably kill you. So, and, you know, we worked with Texas Children's uh, and kids who are born with valve malformations. Sometimes they need, like, six surgeries before they're 18 because their heart's growing, right? And so they keep needing bigger valves. And so it's just devastating to have all that scar tissue in their heart, in their chest. Uh, and so having something that we could use for kids that would grow with the kid would be awesome. Was there anything that inspired you to specifically work on heart valves? Like, why did you choose the heart? Um, so I thought, I have aerospace. I know, like, you know, fluid simulation and blood flow, I can apply it. I actually didn't use much of that, honestly, like, because it was more on materials and cell interaction with materials. So that's kind of that's kind of what put me in the heart valve. But I think the other thing was just the advisors I worked with, and that was what they worked on. And I chose the advisor rather than the project. So, which is good advice for all y'all. So. <laughs> How long did it take you to form your research topic? And what advice would you give to anyone who's gone through that process? Um, I'd say it took about a year to come up with 
sort of a pie in the sky topic and then another year to like bring it back to reality uh, you know what I mean um, and so yeah I would I would say kind of that process is important is to dream big and you know think about you know how awesome this could be and then kind of as you get into research and realizing what's going on you know try to think of I think the important thing is try to think of it in terms of like definitive like if I get this much done then I can write a research paper about it and be done right and then if I have another section that I can kind of box off and write a research paper about I'd be done and so thinking about it in kind of sections uh, so that you're not working for five years toward one single goal that may or may not succeed it's kind of really helpful if you can think about Let's just try to get this little part done. Let's try to get this next part done. Let's try to get this next part done. And so, and it also depends on your advisor. So some advisors are like, you're going to do something with the material, right? Or you're going to like do a new material and do something with it. And then you're going to do all this in vitro testing with it. And then you're going to plant it in the back of a mouse. And like, you know, you know what I mean? They tell you that's what you're going to do. And that's going to be the evaluation of that material. And that's your PhD. So it really depends on your advisor. Um, I would, I mean, a lot of that comes with, you know, advisor selection as well. Is if you if you feel like you need a lot of direction, or if you feel like you want a lot of latitude, um, look looking for the advisor that will give you what what you think you would be best at is important. Is there a reason that you chose a complex organ to focus on rather than like a structural tissue? I mean, I thought heart valves were pretty simple. Uh, you know, like the, just the valve itself is pretty simple, um, but it but it's actually not simple, right? It's like, it's got a very it's got a layered structure and it's very biomechanically complex. The way you know that's why I talk about like it's just amazing that the valve has all these parts. It's just it, it feels like a thin flap of skin, but it has all these parts that do its, their job perfectly. Um, so it's. I mean, yeah, I would say, you know, when you think about, when I say heart valve, if you think about heart, like it's really just a small part of the heart, right? And even if you talk about like uh, tissue engineering for cardiac tissue, for like heart attacks or whatever, it's still just that cardiac muscle tissue, right? It's not really the whole organ. Um, whereas other people are thinking about whole organs like liver, for instance, liver tissue engineering would be like, you got to get the whole function down. Um, so with heart valves, do you need to focus more on like membrane type stuff or fluid movement or what, what type of like strict biological or like physical principles do yeah, you need to so, focus most on? I mean, that's still up in the air. A lot of people would tell you that heart valves, the genetics cause heart valve disease, okay. right? Like there's definitely a whole field. And one of the reasons is for that. There's like, I don't remember, there's like a couple breeds of dogs that get mitral valve disease like all the time and like no other breeds of dogs and so they point to that and say like well it's you're genetically pre pre mm -hmm. disposed to get mitral valve disease no matter what we do um but i think there's more to the story than that i think you know diet and exercise and smoking and all that comes into play right um so i think that one of the I think that one of the important things is you think about cells and they respond to the external forces on them. Mm -hmm. And so if those external forces start to become not what the cells are expecting, right, they start to become dysregulated and diseased and they start to become fibrotic and they start to, you know, do things that they shouldn't do and produce calcium and they calcify, you know. And so I, I, I do think that the mechanical forces that are applied to the valve are, drive a lot of that because of how the cells sense those mechanical forces. Okay. Um, and how all that plays out is like still a mystery, right? Like did the valve, you know, you know, is it because of the way the heart reacted or was like, you know, somebody's valve just formed a little different genetically? Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's a lot of things that go yeah. into that, but. I think ultimately mechanics are driving the cells to do something they shouldn't. Oh. Um, so what was the hardest part 
of your projects in grad school? The most challenging um, time? I would say growing cells uh, on materials and because they are so, they're so finicky. I, finicky is not the right word, but there there's a lot of biological complexity and diversity, right? Because we would get ourselves from, and so one of the problems is we would get ourselves from heart or pig heart valves, and then we would, you know, digest away the extracellular matrix and then put the cells on these plastic flasks where we grew the cells. And so I think a lot of it was as soon as you grow the cells on the plastic flasks, like I was saying, the mechanics play a big issue, they're already like mad. They're like, this is not our native environment, right? And so trying to figure out how much a role that played uh, versus, you know, whatever, like versus a material, like, okay, let's try a different material to grow these cells on and how they respond. Well, they might have already had you know, research has actually shown that they have memory from growing on the plastic flask. Wow. There's a YAPTAS nuclear signaling that you can measure, and when they grow on a very hard surface, you can see it in the nucleus doing something, expressing certain oh, yeah. genes. Um, and so, and so that memory actually continues even after you plate them on a like a hydrogel, which is what I was trying to do, mm -hmm. even on the soft surface. And so I think that combined with I mean, trying to understand, you know, one of the other things that comes up is sex differences, male versus female, right? And so we, our pigs, we never knew the sex of. Um, and so who knows? Like, that's a, mm -hmm. that's a thing that could happen. Like, there's differences in male and female uh, cells. So, like, there's just so, like I said, so much complexity, it's hard to parse all that out. And, you know, we do PCR, you know, and get the results. And we'd have these huge error bars because we're using like 10 different pigs versus 10 other different pigs, right? And like the biological complexity almost dominated the, what we were trying to show. Um, and what, what, well, I, I think you've already answered this, okay. but so what um, is the benefit of using like a tissue engineered valve rather than like a pig valve or a Right, valve and so valve. yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. Think it. But so something that's living that can grow and mm -hmm. self repair uh, and just act like your own tissue, mm -hmm. I think is really helpful. Um, and how long were you in grad school doing this research? Five years. Five years. I mean, okay, four years and nine months. <laughs> 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 yeah, I know. I started. It was like five academic years, basically. Okay. So. Um, and do you think that eventually tissue engineering will like overtake all the rest of heart repairing mechanisms? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, so tissue engineering, like there's also this regen, like a newer term you might hear is regenerative engineering, mm -hmm. which is kind of getting the body to regenerate itself. And that kind of used to be tissue engineering, but I think they're trying to maybe sit, I don't know. You know, it's, so it's hard to say. It's, but the point is that we're trying to make the body either repair itself or even by implanting the right type of material, you just encourage the body to repair mm -hmm. itself, right? And so the idea is that, you know, it, we end up at the final state, you end up with something biological in you rather than something mechanical. Mm -hmm. uh, like that's, that's the million dollar question. Uh, I mean, for heart valves, it seems like it should have been easy, but people have been doing a lot of great research for a lot of years, like 20, 25, 30 years, and we still don't have the tissue engineered heart valve. Like they, try, they thought they had some in Europe and they tried them in kids and they killed a bunch of kids. Uh, so, <laughs> and the people complain, well, the FDA won't let us. I'm like, well, because they don't want to kill a bunch of kids. <laughs> so, it's still very complex. And so that, like I said, the tissue, it seems like a heart valve is simple. Um, you know, one of the cool applications of tissue engineering, and this is in Europe as well, is they've outlawed um, animal testing for cosmetics. Okay. Uh, and so, you know, perfume and makeup companies, they actually have tissue engineered human skin mm -hmm. that they will test their products on rather than on bunnies and what else? So, I mean, that's a pretty cool application for mm -hmm. tissue engineering because then it doesn't have to be 
implanted and worry about all that. Like you just have you can just grow this outside and use it for testing. So that's kind of cool. Uh, yeah. But I think so to answer your question, I think that is going to be the path of tissue engineering in the future for testing purposes. Even with heart valve, like at the end of my PhD, I was advertising our tissue engineering heart valve as more of a platform to understand valve disease rather than we can implant this, right? Like, <laughs> because I was growing things with cells on them and like the FDA is never gonna, or I mean, not for a long yeah. time gonna be allowing you to implant cells mm -hmm. um, for good reason. Uh, so, so like I said, I think tissue engineering as like a disease model will be more and more important going forward. And eventually we'll get to body parts, but I don't know, it'll be a while. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, it'll be a while. So to you, what was the most fascinating or interesting part of your research? Um, I think just realizing, like again, it's just realizing that this thing, like when you cut it out, you know, it just looks so simple. <laughs> it just looks, and just realizing how complex things actually are and how, you know, I mean, when you think about like our heart valves, like I almost get kind of freaked out thinking about like it's opening and closing mm -hmm. and you can hear it. That's what you hear. You hear it slapping. That's the noise the heart <laughs> makes is the heart valve slapping together. And just to think about it happening your whole life and not getting destroyed is amazing, right? Like no machine could ever last that long, right? Like we built any machine. It's never lasted 70 years at yeah. one cycle a second or faster. So that's amazing. <laughs> Is there something else you would like to research on in the future, or have you had any ideas recently? Um, right now I'm done. <laughs> I don't know, that's why I'm teaching now, because I'm like, you know, I, but I, I do think, um, look, I, I, I mean, I really like just all the biomechanics that's out there. Um, I mean, people look at, you know, some of the examples I give in class when we talk about biomechanics in 245 are like a woodpecker. Like people, like woodpeckers don't get concussions. And so just thinking about like, they're hitting their heads on that and you know, we can't go play football without getting concussions. So like what's going, like you know what I mean? What's, how's the woodpecker able to absorb that impact and not damage their brain? Uh, could probably, we could probably learn a lot about that and learn a lot about how biomechanics of us work and maybe how to, prevent injuries in car crashes or playing sports or whatever. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, you know, other things, you know, like shark skin is really cool if you looked at it really closely and just how it works uh, to protect them and to, to swim quickly through water. Uh, you know, there's, there's just some, there's some cool, I mean, you can even think about like, sunflowers that can follow the sun like that is like it's like you know what i mean like they are they don't have muscles but somehow they're moving and following the sun i don't know stuff like that is really cool to me <laughs> <laughs> what would you tell a student who doesn't take a particular interest in research how would you try and convince them to want to continue with their research um i mean i would I, so here's what I would say. If you're not interested in research, there's no reason you have to do research, right? But everybody, I think, gets into that rut where they're sick of research. And so I think that's when you would talk about, and this is what, and I should say, this is what I would tell myself, like, is this really what I want to be doing, right? Like, and maybe it's not, and that's okay if it's not. Not everybody can do research, and not everybody has to do research. Um, there's, and so, you know, I think part of it is just, is that really what you want to do, is research? If so, then kind of know that research is hard and there's going to be difficulties to push through and there's going to be things that you're just going to have to give up on because it's not working and it's a waste of time to keep pushing to continue it to work. Uh, but everybody's, like, you're not the only person who experienced this, right? There's been millions of people who've experienced the same thing. And so just to realize, kind of think about that and realize it. You're not alone in this, and if you want to keep doing research, this is what it takes. So, what would you have done differently in your research, or would you not have changed anything? Um, it's 
a good question. I haven't really thought about it, to be honest. Like, <laughs> um, I think, I mean, it's hard for me to say now, but I think, I'm trying to think. Like, I would try to have done something different to avoid some of that burnout, maybe. Um, but I don't know if that would have mattered or not. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just not sure specifically what I would have done. Uh, sorry, that's not a great yeah. answer, but, uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and now, or even when you were in grad school or in, at NASA, mm -hmm. um, what's the coolest project you've seen being worked on in the lab setting? Um, I mean, so... I mean, some of the stuff at NASA is really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, like, so it's hard to skip that. Like, you know, they they drink their own urine in space. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, so just inventing a thing yeah. that you could go to the bathroom in and it cleans it out and then it's drinking water. Yeah. That, I mean, that's really cool. <laughs> like, uh, um, I mean, I've seen some... The problem with being in like a research, academic research field is you often don't get to see the end product, mm -hmm. right? Like you just see the beginning and you're like, eh, okay, it's a step, but you know, it, it's 10 years out before you actually see, okay, this is how it is and now how it works. Mm -hmm. um, some of the, you know, here's one of the cool things I saw that is a little closer, but um, one of the doctors at, um, in the med center uh, in Houston, Dr. Billy Cohn, you know, all of these artificial hearts still use like some sort of pumping mechanism mm -hmm. to pump blood, like, you know, or LVADs, left ventricular assist devices, are usually pumping mechanisms. So you still end up with a heartbeat and stuff. Well, he ended up doing a impeller system, which is just continuous flow. And he implanted it into a cow, right? And basically took out the cow's heart and implanted a this continuous flow mm -hmm. and the cow didn't seem to mind <laughs> which was amazing when you think about it like yeah. you think about like especially I've just talked about mechanical force as being an important thing like all of a sudden all your blood vessels are no longer getting pulsatile flow they're just mm -hmm. getting continuous flow and it seemed to be working fine uh, and so they're working on like continuous flow LVADs okay. now um, which is crazy to think you would not have a pulse <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so finally, what, why did you decide to become a professor and not go back to industry, for example? Um, I mean, I thought about going back to industry, but I, that was my goal kind of when coming in was to become a professor. Um, and I mean, honestly, I, that's why I'm not going, one of the reasons I'm not going a professor route on the lecturer is because I really enjoy, like, I really wanted to teach, right? And so that's really important to me. And so rather than focusing on writing grants to do research the whole time. Uh, so, I mean, there, there was a lot of figuring out what I want to do with my life. At the end, you know, the last year of my PhD was, well, maybe I should consider industry. Um, but I, I don't know. That was just never one of my goals for going back to PhD school anyway. So. All right. Well, thank you so much, okay. Dr. Perry.